Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Carroll, and thank you all for inviting me here today. It's really exciting to be here and to have such a diverse um, sort of range of speakers and including the regulatory um, people who look at these products. It's I'm very happy to be here. Um, just one point of clarification. So I am here to talk about FDA's regulation of genome editing in animals, but, um, and also USDA is here to talk about genome editing in plants, and also Dr. Marks is here to talk about genome editing in humans. FDA does also look at genome editing in plants. Um, so both through our Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, and then as well as at CVM where I work, we lo also look at um, the safety of uh, genome edited plants in animal feed. So, Okay, so just a brief outline of what I plan to talk to you about today. Um, so just an overview of what is CVM? A lot of people have never heard of the center before, and I have to be honest and tell you, when I applied for the job, I had no idea who CVM was. So um, it was very interesting for me to learn that there was actually a center that um, oversees um, animal drugs and, and products for animals. Um, also going to speak to you a, a little bit about our proposed approach for what we call IGAs, which are, um, in, it's short, we, we in the government like acronyms, so we use them a lot, and I apologize up front for that. Um, but it's intentional genomic alterations in animals. And then a little bit of a highlight about the review process. As you can imagine, it's quite challenging to give specifics about um, the review process for every single product as products um, can vary quite substantially based on, you know, their intended use. So, and then also some of the regulatory challenges that we face. Okay, so where in FDA is CVM? Um, it's probably really hard to read this diagram, but it's actually not that critical that you can read all the words, but we are under the um, Office of the Commissioner, and um, you'll see our sister centers here as well. CVM is circled there in yellow, um, but there's also the Center for Tobacco, Center for Food Safety, CEDAR, CBER, CDRH, so a lot of the other human centers that you're familiar with, all sort of under that same office. And where I work is um, the, so the Division of Animal Bioengineering and Cellular Therapies, which is in the Office of New Animal Drug Evaluations. We have another acronym for that called ONAID. And our acronym for my division is DABCT. Um, and we not only look at uh, intentional genomic alterations in animals, but we also review animal cells, tissues, and cellular tissue-based products. So a lot of the regenerative medicine, the cell-based therapies, um, and then we look at intentional genomic alterations, both heritable and non-heritable. Um, we also work in close collaboration, um, not only within our own office, but also with other offices and centers throughout the agency. Um, you know, some of the products you heard about, such as the xenotransplantation products, involve um, oversight by both CVM as well as other human centers like CBER um, for those types of products. So we work very closely with those centers in the evaluation of those products. Within our division, we have quite a wide range of expertise. Um, so we, we have a lot of scientists with uh, various backgrounds, including veterinarians, animal scientists, um, a lot of cell and molecular biology. We also have a bioinformatician um, who's very valuable to us, and I don't understand a lot of what she does, but I'm very happy to have her. Um, also, this is a relatively new division. Um, we officially um, became a division last year, and I started hiring for the group in 2016, although the group did exist prior to that, um, just in a, another location in the center. And what do we oversee? So I already explained intentional genomic alterations, and this can be produced through various technologies. So I know we're focusing on genome editing here at this colloquium. Um, but we also look at products that are produced through genetic engineering using, you know, I guess sort of the more older recombinant DNA construct technology. 
um, as well as genome editing using all different types of nucleases. Um, and then also various intended uses. So we heard a lot about agricultural uses. Um, you know, we've heard about xenotransplantation and some of the more biomedical types of applications. Um, so we, we really look at a wide range of different types of products. Um, so, and some of those uh, agricultural uses which we heard about for enhanced food production, such as the famous salmon that Dr. Carroll mentioned, um, disease resistance, we heard about African swine fever, we heard about the PERS resistant pig, so there's a lot of exciting work in this area. And then reduced, an al uh, reduced allergenicity, um, where people are actually targeting certain allergens um, that uh, occur from human food consumption. And then um, we look at all types of animals, so not only the food producing, more agricultural animals that we've heard about today, but also companion animals as well. So our main objective, um, so we have a, a public health mission, and as part of that mission, we must ensure that the genomic alteration is safe to the animal, so we don't only look at food safety, we also look at the animal itself and whether or not that alteration is having any impact on the animal's health. And we look at food safety, safe to anyone who consumes food from the animal, and then we also look at effectiveness. A lot of these intended uses, such as disease um, resistance, it's very important for the developer to demonstrate that if they're claiming a particular product is resistant to a certain type of disease, then um, you know they should prove that it does in it is in fact resistant to that disease. Our approach is both science and risk based, um, so we don't only look at data that's generated from developers when they submit a submission or application to us. Um, but we also look at data that's available in the scientific community. So a lot of the work that you all are producing, we, we look at those publications and we use that um, to help guide our decisions. Um, it's also based on risk in that lower risk decreases the data requirements. And I'll explain a bit more about that in the next slide. So, um, for our risk-based approach, this can range anywhere from enforcement discretion, so not everything requires uh, FDA approval. Um, we have enfor exercised enforcement discretion uh, with no data submission, so no prior data review, nothing comes into the FDA that, that product can be marketed, and we've used this um, with like laboratory rodents um, that are typically in highly contained laboratories, also have uh, various other um, means of oversight. And we, all, we, you know, we generally find that these are typically low risk types of products. We also have um, exercise enforcement discretion with prior data review. And for that, we typically look at the Products and we, you know, if it if we think it poses minimal risk, we'll identify, you know, certain questions that we have up front that we would like a developer to address before we decide to make that determination whether or not we're going to exercise enforcement discretion. Um, and and in that case, an approval is also not required. And then lastly, we have um, the prior review and approval, and and that's where you actually go through the review process and um, you know, get your NADA approval. And I should also mention that even in that category, the data needs for an approval are also commensurate with the level of risk associated with the product. Um, so if that product is not intended for food, obviously they wouldn't have to give us data for food safety um, or minimal data for, to address food safety. So this is a little bit about the review process, uh, risk characterization, and as I mentioned, this is quite broad because I'm trying to give you a big picture of every single type of product that exists out there. Um, but these are generally the types of questions that we're asking when we're looking at a specific product. Um, so the foundation of our review pr process and our risk characterization process is really 
the molecular characterization. So we're looking at the alteration itself and, um, you know, developers demonstrate that, you know, they actually made the alteration that they intended to make. Um, we're also interested in any unintended alterations, um, particularly if there's anything that could impact um, animal or human food safety. Um, and it's not solely based on molecular characterization. We also, as you'll see, look at other types of data to look at safety. Um, but we can leverage a lot of this data. Um, for example, if you're making an alteration um, that's going to be used in a product intended for food, um, you know, you can demonstrate that you're not producing any new proteins. So therefore, the food safety um, analysis may be somewhat less intense because a lot of that information has been addressed in the molecular characterization step. So as I mentioned, we also look at the impact of the alteration on animal safety. Um, so aside from molecular characterization, we look at um, the health of the animal. So are those animals healthy? You know, maybe they do have some sort of unintended alteration. Maybe they're still healthy animals. That doesn't mean that a product will not be approvable if they have an off-target effect or if they have an unintended alteration. If the animals are still um, healthy and we can show that um, safety and effectiveness has been demonstrated, then you, know, you could have an approvable product that has some sort of unintended alteration. Whoops. Also, I mentioned food safety. Um, so, you know, part of this is looking at are there any novel proteins that are being expressed that could potentially impact food safety, any toxicity concerns, allergenicity concerns. Um, and generally, uh, you know, when we assess food safety, we look as well as animal safety, it's a comparison. And we look at what's the safety of that alteration um, when compared to animals or food that doesn't have that alteration. And then under our NEPA requirements, um, the National Environmental um, Policy Act, we are required to look at the impact um, on the environment. So we also do an analysis um, to look at, is there any sort of impact of that alteration on the environment? And then lastly is that effectiveness piece, um, ensuring that the alteration does what the developer claims um, that it does. So for a review process, um, you know, a, a lot of people think, you know, we're, we have a very rigid sort of set of requirements. Um, it's actually quite flexible in that we are open to alternative proposals. Um, our requirements are that uh, developers meet safety and effectiveness for an approval. Um, but there are multiple ways to demonstrate that. So we have in, allowed for alternative approaches, and one example is that, of that is alternative approaches to data for multiple generations. Um, a lot of times in certain types of animals, it takes a long time to generate certain species. Um, and then, you know, certain products like the xenotransplantation products, there may not be multiple generations to collect data from. So we're open to alternative proposals to demonstrate that that alteration um, is safe and effective over time. We also consider multiple alterations under a single approval. Um, and this could be either making, you know, different alterations such as um, what was Dr. Yang presented with the perv pig where you're making multiple different alterations to essentially create the resistance or making the same alteration more than once. So you're generating multiple lines of animals and you're essentially just performing the edit more than once. Um, you know, I think with some of the older technologies, it was more typical that you would have one founder animal and you would essentially breed out a line from that animal. And so I think with CRISPR, the use of it is much more efficient. Um, it's, it's much easier and it makes more sense to generate more than one founder animal. So you may have multiple lines of those animals. And so we will consider that under a single approval. We also base our decision, as I mentioned, on current scientific evidence. 
and reevaluate our approach when needed. So we look at what information is available in the scientific literature. Um, you know, if some report comes out tomorrow saying there's absolutely zero chance of, you know, off targets or unintended alterations, then maybe, you know, we don't have concerns about that anymore. So we really rely on a lot of the work that you do. Um, so Dr. Carroll mentioned the salmon. So uh, I usually explain timing to approval in relation to the salmon. Um, <laughs> We've been criticized in the media about taking 20, and it somehow it keeps growing. I think I read 30 as well, years for an approval. Um, I will mention that was before my time. Um, but the salmon was approved in 2015, and it's still not on the market in the United States. Um, so there are some various political challenges associated with that product. Um, it is available in Canada. And I think it's largely being sold to restaurants there. And I hear it's quite delicious. So, um, so our timelines, going back to timing. Um, so we work under user fee timelines. And these are timelines that are negotiated by the regulated industry and approved by Congress. So for certain submission types, we have certain deadlines which we much, must meet for our review of that information. We also typically evaluate these products using a phased review process, and that is um, the submissions come in, so there are certain pieces, um, so we call them technical sections, um, that are used and submitted in support of an approval. And you know, sponsors send these to us when they're ready. So it's not always sequential. Um, sometimes, you know, it takes time for developers to generate the data. Sometimes, you know, they don't have the money to do the studies yet. So sometimes there can be time lags between, um, you know, each submission of data. There's also uh, a bit of a time lag with regards to when a file is opened and when we actually see data towards an approval. And even though I didn't work on the SAM, and I did look back at that um, review process, and it took 11 years when they opened the INAD until the first actual submission of data towards an approval. So I think that's quite significant. Um, and I, I think it really gives a clearer picture of sort of, you know, what is involved in the evaluation of these products. And so... We encourage developers to come in and talk to us early on. We don't expect you to be ready to submit data in support of an approval right away. We wanna have those early conversations. We think it's essential for us to get an understanding of the product and to have discussions with you about what the data requirements might be for an approval and you know if there are any um, issues or or hurdles that we foresee, we can overcome those hurdles early on so they don't become a problem later on and delay the approval process. Um, other factors that um, can impact timing, which would be um, product complexity. Um, there's a lot of sensitivity, whether a product's being used for food. Um, I think we've all learned a lot uh, talking about sort of consumer perception. Um, and, you know, I know that definitely impacted um, the salmon as well. And then also, if there are any environmental concerns as well, um, that could potentially delay timing. You know, we talked a lot about gene drives. Um, you know, there are certain intended uses that do have a significant, um, potentially significant environmental impact that we need to assess. Um, and then also with the salmon, I know there was um, public meetings that were held, and that does take some time because not only do you have to, you know, plan and hold the meetings, but you also need to address comments from those meetings. So, um, you know, we want to be transparent, we want to interact with the public, but it does take time to do that. So I think it's important to note. So recently, um, we, uh, FDA actually published a plant and animal innovation um, biotechnology um, uh, was action plan. Thank you. <laughs> it's a really long name. 
Um, and under that action plan, uh, we actually had some key initiatives for animal biotechnology. So that action plan was basically outlining, you know, FDA's commitment towards biotechnology um, in both um, plant and animal sectors. And, um, you know, it talked about a lot of our key initiatives going forward. And one of those initiatives for uh, animals was the Veterinary Innovation Program, which we piloted in October of last year. And it's just been over a year that that's been going on. We um, set up this program. It's modeled largely after the breakthrough program on the human side. Um, it has certain benefits to it. Uh, first of all, it, it's available to not only to intentional genomic alterations, but also to our animal cell and tissue-based products. And it's limited to those that are seeking approval. Um, and also, there's a requirement that the intended use provides a benefit to either animal or human health, food production, or animal well-being. We have currently 13 sponsors enrolled, and I think since the time I made these slides, we may have gotten a couple more. Um, and then this just outlines some of the benefits involved in that process. I won't walk through all of them, but just to highlight, a lot of it is that intensive interaction that we have. We offer the opportunity for uh, pre-review feedback, so developers can send us a submission and we can look it over and identify any sort of inadequacies with that submission that they can address prior to formally submitting it. Um, we do the same thing post-review to walk through any comments and how they might um, you know, correct any inadequacies. And then a major benefit of this program is actually the ability to stop and restart the review clock. So essentially, I mentioned these user fee timelines. When a submission comes into us, um, it's placed in a reviewer's queue, and there's an associated time frame with that. So, you know, if we find um, that something is missing, a piece of data is missing or something that needs to be addressed, we can stop the clock during the review process and then allow the sponsor to amend it with that information and then it picks back up with the timing so it doesn't kick sponsors out of the queue. So just briefly, um, we've also um, recently published on our website uh, where we've exercised enforcement discretion. And as you can see here, some examples would be the glowing aquarium fish, glowfish, as well as our animal models of disease. So, you know, we intend to, I think in the next year, have a series of meetings. We really see the importance of stakeholder outreach. Um, we think it's important for us to communicate um, you know, our approach, um, as well as get feedback from our stakeholders about our process and, you know, ways we can improve it. Um, we've heard a lot, particularly from people in academia about, you know, increasing transparency, predictability. Um, I think it's really difficult when you're in a lab setting to understand what it means to transition to a commercial setting and to get a regulatory approval. And, you know, we really wanna help people who have these kinds of questions. Um, and so we're seeking input um, to, you know, for ideas on how, how to best get you that information. And we're also planning to seek out a wide variety of different types of stakeholders. So we also intend to go to the farmers and producers. Um, there's a lot of questions out there, some misconceptions that, you know, if I have animals that um, have been genome edited on my farm, is FDA going to come out and inspect me? Or, um, you know, do I have to put a slap a label on the animal? There's a lot of questions that uh, are misconceptions that we'd really like to address. Um, the answer to those is no. Um, <laughs> so we, we would really like to do this outreach and we have a lot of meetings planned in uh, FY20 for this purpose. We also recently had 
a really interesting meeting in Brussels um, with our international counterparts. It was a regulator only meeting and it focused on genome editing. And we were able to share our different regulatory approaches as well as our experience with these different types of products. And we found that to be very valuable. So switching gears, what are some of the challenges, challenges we face? Um, so I, I tried to make this more specific to genome editing. Um, you know, we have questions, you know, we hear a lot, you know, why do you want to regulate these products? They're low risk or we know they're safe. Um, and, you know, we, we have questions that we think need to be addressed. And I also want to say um, we actually get this question a lot, particularly from people in academia. Um, you know, I know this is safe. I've done all these tests in my lab. So why do I, why do I need to go through this regulatory process? And, you know, we're not here to tell you something is unsafe. We're not saying we, we don't like CRISPR. We don't like, um, you know, these technologies. We just want you to show us the data demonstrating that it's safe and effective. And we think this is very beneficial because we really think that consumers rely on our evaluation of these products. And we think it's very critical um, for the success of this technology to have that FDA um, sort of stamp of approval. So um, I've just cited here some of the recent reports of unintended alterations. Um, so we know that unintended alterations do exist. Um, so, you know, we've talked about some of these with some of the large scale deletions that are close to the target site. Um, or you know, extraneous integration of you know viral vectors or so forth, and you know we know this happens, but what is the impact on safety and effectiveness? And I and I think that is still a question that you know we're trying to figure out. So recently, um, we have our own publication. Um, a lot of you have heard about the pulled cattle through various presentations here. And we published a preprint um, in July. And this has recently been accepted to Nature Biotechnology and is pending publication. Um, but basically, you know, we at the time, I had just hired my bioinformatician in the group, and we were developing a bioinformatics pipeline to set ourselves up to be able to evaluate any sort of next generation sequencing data that um, developers are submitting to us in support of their applications. And so, um, you know, our bioinformatician developed a pipeline and in order to test out this pipeline, she wanted to use a test set. And we knew about the Carlson publication by Recombinetics that was published in Nature Biotechnology in 2016. And this was a publicly available whole genome sequencing data set that we could use to test our system. And so we used that. Um, we also looked at the experimental conditions and, you know, looking at what, you know, was used in the experiment. And uh, what Carlson and his colleagues did at Recombinetics was uh, for the template for the homology directive repair, they used a plasmid. Um, so, Unfortunately, when, when they reported their findings, um, you know, they did a very thorough job. They did whole genome sequencing. They showed the cows don't have horns. Um, they also looked at off-target effects. They found nothing. Um, but unfortunately, they failed to detect inter integration of the plasmid. Um, and, you know, this could have been a potentially simple fix, um, which either, you know, they could have picked up by aligning that plasmid sequence um, or by, you know, just extending the primers of their PCR experiment. So unfortunately, they missed that. Um, and I just want to make the point that, you know, this uh, finding that we reported, you know, it does demonstrate that sometimes things are missed. And I don't think, you know, anyone had bad intentions. Um, you know, I, I, people can, can say, you know, oh, it's an alteration that's the same as found in nature. So why do you need to look at it? 
Um, well, I think, you know, we just want to make sure that, you know, it's, it's the same as found in nature. And that could be potentially minimal risk. Um, unfortunately, in this case, they missed it. And I don't know if this would have any impact on safety. Um, it might not. I think, you know, as I mentioned, our risk characterization analysis, it goes beyond just looking at the molecular data. So you could have a plasma there that is potentially benign. It has no impact on the safety of the animal or the safety of the food from that animal. Or you could have an integration event that occurs at a very important, significant part of the genome that could impact animal safety. And so I think we just want to ensure that you know, developers are doing what they intend to do. So we're not trying to catch anyone in anything. Um, we just want to make sure that the products they're producing are safe and effective, and they're using the appropriate screening methods to ensure that. Got it. OK, I will skip through detection methods. We all know there are challenges, no sort of gold standard with detection methods. And then this is my last slide. I will just mention that um, there was a NAS report uh, back in 2016 called Preparing for Future Products of Biotechnology, and it discusses some recommendations for regulatory oversight. And one of those relates to unfamiliar or complexity and how, you know, as you become more familiar or how as complexity decreases, that could potentially change how you look at a, a type of product. And, that's a model that we're trying to apply. Um, so we really think there's a lot of value in that recommendation.